So welcome to the next session. Um, and uh, this is a talk that's going to be given to us by Francis Ross. Um, so Francis is an Ellen Swallow Philip Richards uh, Professor of Materials Science and Engineering um, at MIT. Um, so she is a, an alumna. So um, she did her bachelor's in physics uh, before doing a PhD in material science. Um, and this is where the uh, love of electron microscopy originated. Um, and uh, she's going to talk to us about her work that she's doing um, on crystals. So I shall hand straight over to Francis. Great, Diana, thank, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen, let's see if that works. Excellent, all right, first first part done. Okay, we we got to this point. So so what a pleasure this is. It, it, it was really fun to get the, uh, the original message from Lindsay to talk at this forum. Um, as you can see, I'm in the other Cambridge uh, after, uh, as Serena said, uh, doing my PhD in in the original Cambridge, uh, I spent time in uh, in Bell Labs, in Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and at IBM before ending up here in in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm going to talk about ele electron microscopy and especially how we use it to understand how crystals grow by making movies of what they're actually doing when they're growing. Um, so. Um, this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in. I'm showing you a few examples here. And the first one is a catalyst at work. So this thing at the top, this blobby part here, is a gold silicon eutectic liquid catalyst. And its job is to catalyze the formation of silicon into a crystalline nanowire. We'll talk about this a bit later on. But for now, just, just look at the dynamics of this thing going in the microscope. You can see, uh, look at the scale bar here. You can see in this kind of environmental TEM where we flow gases and typically heat up the sample, you can see lattice resolution of the silicon uh, structure. You can see the liquid droplet. You can see the dynamics recorded at 400 images a second. And you can see this weird business on the surface. This is supposed to be a liquid liquid at this uh, temperature and pressure, but it's actually got a crystalline surface, which in this case inhibits the uh, catalytic properties of the object. So that's why there's actually nothing growing here. So anyway, so this is the high resolution imaging using environmental TEM to show a uh, physical process. Here's a second one where we are looking at uh, gold triangles that have been placed on a graphene sheet, which doesn't really show up. It's just this background haziness. As we warm them up, you can see how poorly bonded they are with the surface, how they move around. And look especially at this bottom one. They can uh, rotate you see that? Uh, as you warm them up, uh, as well as uh, slide along the surface. Um, and then finally, this is a reaction taking place in water. Um, what we're seeing is the nucleation and growth of bubbles of hydrogen. Uh, they're nucleating at a, a defect on the interior surface of the little capsule in which the water is being held. So to do these kinds of experiments, you have to in encase your water layer in two windows. So you're looking through a kind of sandwich of uh, solid material that prevents the water from evaporating, and then a thin layer of water, and then another window, so that the whole thing is done in transmission. The electrons pass through the whole sample and record the dynamic processes that take place in the liquid. So this is good for corrosion, electrochemistry, nucleation and growth of particles in solution, that kind of thing. So um, this uh, process liquid cell electron microscopy, I'm actually not going to talk about that, but I will talk about these other versions of, um, of environmental transmission electron microscopy and how they help us to understand crystal growth physics. So I'm going to show quite a few different uh, results, and it's been a pleasure to collaborate with a number of students, postdocs, and uh, other faculty members in these experiments. But I especially want to acknowledge the technical support. So what you'll see is some, some somewhat unusual um, experimental equipment, and you can't really do this without somebody who's really interested in designing, building, troubleshooting, maintaining, improving the equipment. And so uh, we really base all of our stuff on the work of the technical support staff whose role is so important uh, in, in, in research. And I'd also like to thank a number of funding agencies who've supported us along the way. So, of course, it's fun to make movies in the microscope, but, you know, in, in practical terms, you have to say, what is my mission? Why am I doing this uh, in, in the 
excuse me, in the first place. And the thing that really motivates uh, our work is this grand challenge in material science. Of course, as material scientists, we want to design and build materials that have specific desirable properties. And those could be structural or electronic or anything else. But um, often in pushing the frontiers of materials design, we look at the nanoscale. Um, shrinking the size of a material to the nanoscale often unlocks new properties that you don't get in bulk uh, volumes of the same material. So our question is, can we use nanoscale devices, nanoscale objects to, um, to form um, materials that have properties that we're interested in. So how can we build these nanoscale volumes of material? And I'm talking really nanoscale. So this, this is a, an example of a true nanoscale object. It's a, it's a magnetic bit. <clears throat> it's made up of 12 iron atoms that were individually moved into place using a scanning tunneling microscope tip. And so this kind of thing is fabulous for publishing results and doing basic physics. But unfortunately, in the real world, this is far too slow to build, say, the memory elements of a of a computer chip. So we don't want to use this. But instead, we want to <coughs> we want to use self assembly. And this is obviously um, a spontaneous process. It's parallel. A lot of nanostructures are created all at once. You don't have to do anything in particular. You just let the material reach its lowest energy state um, by setting up the appropriate conditions. And so in this case, where raindrops fall on a window, <clears throat> we don't have to tell them to be hemispherical. The surface tension will take care of that for us. But this kind of picture illustrates a problem with self-assembly, which is that things are not particularly uniform. They may nucleate in random places. They have different sizes. They may not be the exact shape that you want. So here's the question. Can we use a simple process like self-assembly, which could be cheap, it could be rapid, simple. Uh, can we use that to build a structure which is complex, predictable, precise? And so this is where we find that imaging a self-assembly process as it takes place is a very powerful way to understand the physics of what's going on and thereby uh, control the process itself. So that's our objective in doing this electron microscopy. And to illustrate it, I want to show two different examples. The first one is the growth of semiconductor nanowires, and the second one is the uh, growth of materials on, on 2D surfaces. So I'll, I'll show you that later on. So firstly, let's talk about semiconductor nanowires. One of my absolute favorite uh, subjects in electron microscopy is the growth of nanowires. And in much of nano science, nanotechnology, you don't have a good picture of what you're trying to explain. So you tend to go for PowerPoint science where you have a beautiful looking diagram that shows how it ought to be taking place. And then you say, oh, yeah, this must be what's going on. Um, let's go from there. So here's the PowerPoint science version of nanowire growth. The trick is, let's say we want to grow a nanowire, which is a long, thin, single crystal of some material. Let's grow a nanowire out of silicon. So we start with a silicon wafer, which has a very clean surface. And then we place a catalytic droplet on top of the silicon. And our catalytic droplet is a gold silicon eutectic liquid. So we're at a temperature of about 400 or 500 degrees C. And then the trick is to supply some extra silicon. And we can do that by flowing a gas like disilane. This gas is quite reactive. You flow it uh, across the surface. It sticks on the amorphous surface of the catalyst much more readily than it sticks on the a uh, single crystal perfect surface of the uh, wafer in between the droplets. So it sticks on this surface. Uh, the thermal, the temperature causes it to dissociate. The hydrogen goes away. The silicon is left behind. And now the silicon can diffuse through the liquid, find a place to stick. And the place it stays is the junction between the droplet and the rest of the silicon wafer. So it adds to this point. And as you continue the process, the nanowire gets longer. The catalyst gets carried uh, upwards with it. So this process was actually developed, uh, understood from post-growth observations in 1964. So an amazing uh, piece of work done actually at Bell Labs. And if we <clears throat> if we take this PowerPoint science and we transform it into the microscope observation, look at what happens. It's actually exactly what we see in the microscope. Here's the nanowire growing. It's actually a hexagonal prism. It's growing in the crystallographic one-on-one direction. This is a flat 
one 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 surface, um, you can see it's growing and I'm not just moving the sample because we have these features on the surface that are fixed and the wire is just growing and extending. <clears throat> as long as we do the experiment, flow the gas, keep the temperature up, we get the continuous growth of a perfect crystal. These lines are actually uh, like contour lines on the map. They tell you how thick the the crystal is at that point, but otherwise it's a perfect, uh, every atom is exactly in place, all right? So that's how it looks in the microscope. How do we get these movies? Um, here's a photograph of our microscope. Um, the electrons generated up here, they pass through some lenses, through the sample, down through some projector lenses to magnify the image, and then we can record a movie at the bottom. Uh, the important part is the gas dosing system. We have to flow these toxic gases. We have to be able to heat the sample, tilt it so it's just at the right angle. And most importantly, we have to be able to prepare a clean surface. Um, on which to do the growth process. So we need the microscope to have very good vacuum within it such that the surface does get does not get dirty before or during the growth experiment. So this microscope is customized such that the vacuum at the quality of the vacuum at the sample is really, really good. Um, and what I'm going to show you is that with this kind of equipment, the in situ observations can give us real real quantitative clues, uh, as well as showing things that we didn't expect to see. Um, this is how the sample is uh, set up. So the nanowires are growing outwards. The electron beam is coming down vertically and you get a fabulous view of the growth process taking place. All right. So what do we see when we examine these movies in a bit more detail? Here's a silicon nanowire growing and look at it very closely. And what you can see is a kind of a pulsing mode of growth. It's not really continuous. It's kind of happening in little jumps. So as well as conventional measurements like what is the phase of the catalyst, what's the morphology, what's the growth rate, the kinetics, etc., um, we can look at the details of how the atoms are added at the interface. Now, here's a movie. Here's actually the same movie. So I'm just going to cut out this little piece um, and blow it up and slow it down. And this is what you see. You see something happens really quickly and then you see nothing happening for a long time. So nothing and nothing. And you're waiting and waiting until until blam there. The whole thing, the whole sheet of silicon atoms was added onto the nanowire within one movie frame, within a four hundredth of a second. Now, let's compare this growth of silicon from a gold silicon liquid to the growth of gallium arsenide from a gallium droplet. Uh, here's a dark field image. Uh, it, it's The imaging conditions don't show the catalyst very well, but can you just see it there? See the droplet is just there. If we look at this kind of growth, what you see is a more continuous flow. Do you see the action at the interface? Do you see the steps of gallium arsenide? The, the atomic layers of gallium arsenide are adding in a much more of a continuous way. So what does this tell us about the physics of the growth? So the thing to remember is that the silicon is arriving at the catalyst at a steady state, a steady rate. And it has to answer the question, should it stay in solution or should it precipitate at the interface? So let's suppose we have a catalyst that has very low solubility for the growth species. So the silicon comes in. And it doesn't really want to fit into the solid lattice of the catalyst. As soon as it arrives, it has to find somewhere else to go. And the place it finds is on a step edge at the interface. So any silicon coming in immediately adds to the step edge. The step flow is continuous. On the other hand, supposing the catalyst has a high solubility for the growth species, which means in more mathematical terms that there's not much of an energy penalty to adding more silicon into the catalyst. So you keep adding, the silicon remains in solution, there's no reason for it to go anywhere else. But eventually, um, so much silicon piles up, the chemical potential gets too high, eventually a step nucleates. And at that point, there's so much extra silicon in here that it can all immediately add onto the step. The step gets completed, it flows across the growth interface, and you get this very sudden addition of a whole a layer of silicon, and then you have a waiting time for the whole process to cycle. So these kinetics, without going through the details of the derivations, the kinetics here tell us a lot about the physical properties of the catalyst and the growth material. And through this kind of mathematical understanding, we can 
look at the relationship between the properties of the catalyst and the properties of the nanostructure that it is growing. So in particular, the sharpness of interfaces within nanowires. By this, I mean the following process. It's really fun to grow <coughs> a nanowire made of silicon, but really that's a lot of work just to grow silicon. All the electronic uh, properties of these nanowires involve creating a uh, a heterostructure, so a controlled interface between materials. So what we do is we grow silicon, um, we turn off the silicon gas, we turn on another gas like germanium, and then we continue to grow. Uh, the silicon in principle would stop growing, the germanium would start to grow, you would have a beautiful interface between them, um, and so you could make a quantum well. So in doing this kind of process, we need to have low solubility catalyst so that we don't have this big reservoir of material uh, within the catalyst that would smear out the interface. So this is how uh, the property of the final nanowire depends on the properties of the catalyst and how we can make some effort to predict what kind of structures we're going to get for a given catalyst and a given pair of materials that we're trying to grow. So we thought, well, this is all very fine. Let's try this um, catalyst process uh, to grow an interface between silicon and a metal so that we can make an elect electrical connection to the end of the nanowire. Let's grow some nickel silicide. It's a common interconnect material used in microelectronics. So let's take the second, the new element as nickel. And let's add it into the catalyst and see what we get. And as always, electron microscopy can surprise you. Instead of growing a nice uniform layer at the interface, what we get is some weirdness. We get this weird thing forming in the catalyst. It floats around. It's an octahedron. It floats around. It sticks down onto the surface. And then as we grow more silicon, we can embed this little particle. It's like an ice cube in a drink at this point floating on the surface. Eventually it gets uh, frozen in, embedded in the nanowire and we have a quantum dot within our nanowire. And so, in fact, this is what's going on here. Our second element is actually creating a new phase within the droplet. The phase is free floating until it sticks down, and then you can embed it within the nanowire. So this is an example where in situ observation show you something you never would have expected. There's no way to have predicted this kind of behavior. And so it's a kind of exciting thing that you get from doing these observations is that you can sit there and think, well, you know, nobody ever saw this happening before. And who would have guessed this would be the way it would go? All right. So I don't want to leave nanowires by with I want I don't want to leave you with the impression that it always works and it's always happy. Um, there's a lot of ways these experiments can fail. If the vacuum is dirty, you get contamination on the sample and nothing grows. If something goes wrong with the flow of materials, you can get these bizarre uh, structures caused by lack of surface diffusion. You can get kinking of the nanowires if the droplet doesn't stay on the tip. And most fun of all is this process here. Two nanowires happily growing along uh, near each other. But look what's happening here. The gold from this one is actually disappearing. It's not evaporating. It's diffusing away over the surface. This is the process of oxford ripening where a small object is less stable than a nearby large one. And so the atoms one at a time diffuse away from here and on average will end up in here. So this is a way that these nanowires fail. But it's also a really fun way to look at some of the basic physics of this surface diffusion process that is important in their growth. All right, so the second um, material I'll talk about is uh, is actually an interface between materials. I'm going to now switch our attention to the um, fascinating world of 2D materials, thin, uh, atomically thin sheets of material joined together by only weak van der Waals bonds. And these materials like graphene, hexagonal bore and nitride, molybdenum and disulfide, and many, many other ones have formed a really exciting area of nanoscience. They have such fascinating properties, especially because you can stack them up in so many different ways. You can build a device by having layers of, for example, a semiconductor, an insulator, materials with different band gaps or different magnetic properties. And twisting the materials as you stack them up, as is shown here, is a practical way to achieve new physics, new functionality. And so this is a drawing of the famous um, magic angle twisted uh, graphene. If you twist 
two sheets of graphene by 1.1 degrees, you can uh, get emergent properties like superconductivity. So really a fabulous area to work in. But most 2D materials need to be connected to 3D materials because the rest of the world is a 3D uh, you know, it's made up of 3D materials. So what happens at the interface between 2D materials and 3D materials? Uh, even if you have two 2D materials, you can get a moray pattern as the um, lattices go in and out of registry. You get the same thing between a 2D and a 3D uh, crystal. This is gold on MOS2. Um, and you can see in these electron microscopy images recorded in different modes, you can see the lattice of the 2D material, and then you can see the moray pattern between it and the gold islands in these different images. So to do these experiments, to look at how these interfaces form and what determines their structure, we can use the same kind of microscopy equipment. We can make our 2D layer suspended over a hole in a much thicker support structure. So now we have a sheet of just a few atoms thick, and then we can deposit the 3D material on top of it, and we can record what happens um, as these structures build up uh, onto the 2D surface. And so this is the kind of experiment that we did first. We put gold on MOS2. It looks horrible. It's just these blobs. And then we realized, well, we have to clean the surface very well. There's such weak bonding between gold and the 2D surface that any kind of contamination or dirt will mess things up. There's no reason really why it should bond nicely if it has any excuse not to do so. So instead, if we clean the surface very well, we can now get epitaxial gold islands. They're well aligned on the substrate, on the, on the 2D material. They have the correct shape. And they show these beautiful moray patterns. So we were pretty pleased with ourselves. And then we started looking back in the literature. And here's a paper from the 70s uh, at, at which uh, the same experiment was done here with gold on MOS2. It was called molybdenite in those days, a mineral. It's a naturally forming mineral. But it's just amazing the quality and the um, the results that were obtained from older microscopy experiments. Uh, and so it was such fun seeing the, it, the photo of the first electron microscope in in the department earlier on in Lindsay's talk, just to imagine those guys having such fun with uh, with imaging things that people had never seen before. Anyway, so, um, all right, so we can relate these moray patterns to the electronic properties of the interface of the kind of composite material of gold and MOS2 as follows. Um, let's look in TEM. This is the, the images that I just showed you. Measure the spacing of these moray patterns, and it's about 18 angstroms. Let's now go to scanning tunneling microscopy, which measures the electronic uh, properties of an interface. Now, it's the other way up. This is MOS2 on gold instead of gold on MOS2. But look, that period is uh, is quite different. And it's not a calibration area, error. We actually scratched our heads for a long time trying to figure out what was going on here until it occurred to us that the reason these two techniques give different results um, for something that should be pretty simple is because they're looking at different aspects of the structure. TEM is a, is a, is a, um, projection imaging technique primarily. You look through all of the layers. You could imagine them all being superposed on each other. And if we look at the gold structure, which is made up of three different layers, A, B, and C, with different positions uh, that constantly repeat to give the gold structure, if you superimpose those and squash them all flat onto one uh, onto one surface and you calculate the moray pattern that would make with the MOS2, you get, in fact, what you see in TEM. But if you consider only the bottommost layer, it has a different period. Its moray pattern should be different. So, in fact, the 3D structure of a 3D, 2D interface is very important in determining the electronic properties because the electronic properties depend primarily on only the gold atoms that are closest to the 2D material, and the ones above don't play that much of a role. Okay, so 2D, 3D interfaces provide exciting opportunities for tuning up materials properties. And uh, so let's extend this a little bit further by asking ourselves 
uh, how can we more generally understand the interface between a 2D material and a 3D material? And how can we create particular interfaces that we might want to um, that we might want to work with? And so many of the devices that use 2D materials do, in fact, require a, a very nice interface between the 2D material and some 3D structure uh, in order to get the properties that you want in the um, uh, in the final uh, device. So what I'm going to show you for the last couple of minutes is that nanowire growth physics that we talked about earlier does indeed provide some guidance to forming high quality aligned uh, structures where 3D and 2D materials match and that we can extend the properties, uh, we can extend our reach in this area by using different types of growth uh, experiment to, to see what's going on. So here's an example. We'd like to grow germanium, a semiconductor, on a 2D material. Here, here we're growing on graphene. And if we grow germanium, it doesn't really form much, much of anything. It's, it's an ugly kind of a thing. But we know that gold grows very well on graphene. Um, and so let's start with gold triangles and use them as catalysts to grow germanium. So it's just the same as the process I showed before for growing nanowires, um, but it, it plays out in a slightly different way. Come on. Now, this is not the most exciting movie ever, but look here. Some germanium just grew. Now look here. Look here. Look here. And wait for it. There we go. A lot of waiting around in these experiments. You see that lighter patch, that's some germanium growing. So what happens is germanium's not talking to graphene, but the gold talks to the graphene and the gold talks to the germanium. So we have a kind of chain of materials whereby um, gold grows on graphene, germanium grows on gold, and therefore germanium is aligned with graphene. We can do the same thing for silicon, um, we can do the same thing for silicon if we choose a different catalyst. Gold doesn't work as a catalyst. Silver is better. The temperatures of growth are more compatible. But silver doesn't grow on graphene very nicely. So instead, we're going to use gold. We can grow gold on graphene. We can then grow silver on gold. And then we can use the silver to grow the silicon. So we have a longer chain of materials, which results in all of the crystal structures of all of these materials being well aligned with each other. And for other materials like gallium arsenide here, there are different strategies you can use. Uh, gallium arsenide seems to grow quite nicely from gallium droplets. So we can extend this to other semiconductors and other materials combinations, and including some of the weird things that we could understand from nanowire growth. This is another picture of one of those nickel structures that I showed before. You can now imagine taking these types of experiments and doing them instead of on the tip of a nanowire, having Having these droplets existing on the surface of a 2D material and using that to grow new structures on the 2D material to extend its functionality. All right. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is an outlook. Um, I've shown you experiments done in environmental TEM where we have to control very well the environment, the low pressure for this, for cleaning the sample uh, and the imaging to get movies of how the crystals grow. So control of the environment is really important for creating and maintaining clean surfaces. And it also allows us to uh, observe reactive materials that would otherwise oxidize. So, for example, suppose we want to grow niobium on a 2D material. Niobium is going to oxidize, so let's grow it in the UHV microscope and then we can image it before we've taken it out into the air and potentially changed its structure. But having a clean surface, as I mentioned before, also helps us to control nucleation. If there's no distractions, no dirt or random contamination, then if you deliberately put a nucleation site on the surface, that nucleation site will be able to uh, influence the growth of um, of uh, our second material on the surface. So here's an example of a gold triangle that has grown on one of these little marks that we've made with a focused iron beam, and we can potentially then pattern the gold and make devices such as plasmonic ones that rely on having a like a, a pattern of metals on a on a surface. 
So I'd like to conclude by saying that I think I feel like we're in a really exciting moment. Um, there's a lot of developments going on in the field of electron microscopy in terms of setting up in situ experiments, flowing gases, having a clean uh, environment, uh, but also better um, better cameras, better electron optics with aberration correction, um, fabulous opportunities for imaging with quite low energy electrons that will not damage the surface uh, in the same way that the higher ones do. So all of these um, experimental tools are giving us opportunities to study materials processes, both vapor phase and liquid phase. So really the need for new materials and growth techniques, uh, the need to make nanoscale structures with perfect control by understanding their growth physics is is having a very fortunate intersection with all the developments and imaging tools. So I think that the, this is a great place to be in and a really fun area to work and I think has many opportunities for the future. So I'll conclude my talk then uh, and uh, happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you very, very much, Francis. Absolutely fascinating talk. And I, I don't know whether you can see all of the, the likes, the uh, the thumbs going up on the screen. <laughs> oh, okay. I've been wondering about these floating thumbs, you know, for the whole day. But. Um, so we're we're running slightly behind time, which is not your fault at all. Um, so I think I'll just take a couple of questions, if that's OK, and then perhaps sure. people can contact you uh, in, in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question from uh, Gianluca uh, Mamoli. So um, asking how much control do we have on the sticking uh, self-assembly of 2D materials at this scale? Um, we can control 2D material stacking extremely well if we do it by hand. So if you have you have a light microscope and you pick them up with a sticky uh, uh, polymer and you lift them up, you put them somewhere else, you stick them down and you unpeel the polymer and the, the material is there. And then you can take a second one. So you can build a stack of arbitrary 2D materials and you can even twist them on their way down so that they have the correct orientation. So this is truly at the at the um, circumstance of putting things in one at a time, like I showed first with the with the magnetic uh, atoms. So in order to make actual real practical devices, you need to automate this in some way. So the way to do that then is not just to pick them and place them each time, but to find some way that they would land there without you doing it individually. So either some liquid phase thing where things float in or some way to rotate materials using external fields to get them aligned correctly. But at the moment, we're definitely in a, you know, do it one at a time kind of mode. So I think the opportunity is really, you know, there's a lot to be done in this in this area. Thank you. Um, so there's another question from Rachel Oliver. Um, so, again, um, Gianluca had said amazing presentation and uh, Rachel Oliver says beautiful images. Um, she says in the silicon and germanium growth on catalysts on graphene, uh, it looks like the semiconductor particles are eating into the catalyst particle. Is that the case or is it a projection effect? Yeah, yeah good, good, good watching, uh, Rachel. Um, it does seem like... Um, in, in the case of a nanowire, you're growing out into space, as it were. So the material can add at the interface and the catalyst gets carried along with the process. In the case of growing on a surface, the catalyst is, is stuck on the surface, but not very well. When the second material grows on the surface, it actually is, is attached quite well to the surface. And then you have... Uh, then you're trying to grow this interface between two things that are both stuck down. So essentially, there's a little fight between them. And because the gold is softer, the gold atoms are displaced. So it truly is the case that once you nucleate the semiconductor and it grows, it pushes the uh, catalyst ahead of it on the surface, not as a whole, but by pushing atoms at the interface, they get displaced uh, over to the rest of the catalyst. So it's uh, it's definitely kind of a, a collective process between these two materials as they um, <laughs> as they try to minimize their energy by, uh, you know, changing their their structure, their, their conformation a little bit. Yeah. OK, fantastic. Yeah. So um, but there are uh, other questions, but I think I'm going to have to leave those people to to contact you directly. Um, happy to thank you yeah. so much, Francis.